Hi, and welcome to Sask Music's Indigenous History Month interview series. My name is LJ Tyson, and I'm joined today by the CEO of Mississippi Broadcasting Corporation, Deborah Charles. Deb, how are you? I'm fine, LJ. How are you? Very good. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're very busy, but I appreciate you taking the time to be interviewed for this interview series. Oh, you are most welcome. Thank you for having me today. So Deb, for those that have lived under a rock for the past how many years, do you want to give a little background on um, NBC Radio? Well, in, NBC was incorporated in 1984, and we launched our first um, Cree Mississippi at Jimwin on January 6, 1985, under CBC Airwaves. We didn't have our own network at the time. So what um, the former manager, Robert Morasti, and the assistant, Nat Gardner, and Tom Roberts, what they did was they used to uh, can their shows and go to CBC and uh, broadcast from there. Um, we used to do two hours a day. Um, it was 1 to 3 p.m. As we branched away and got our own funding, over a million dollars um, for six staff, we got our own equipment and they have operating costs and, and administration costs, but there was a, over a million that they were once funded for um, developing their own network. And then we started at 20 hours a week. Uh, we, then they included the Dene because a part of the Northern Saskatchewan, it was built in Northern Saskatchewan for Northerners. As we got into our strategic planning, we went uh, more south and we, in 1992, we broke away from CBC, got our own network, and we started uh, probably at 12 hours a day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and the rest was uh, recorded. Um, we incorporated a subsidiary company in 1990, 1989 to 1990, which was our bingo, um, uh, Natarwin, which means listen in Cree, Natutuin Incorporated. And we started fundraising um, bingo operations to sustain more staff, sustain our operations. We were cut in 1994 um, from the federal government of 16%, which was we went from a million to 326,855 for operating costs. So we closed for a month to uh, keep the, the, the staff on at the time, which is probably about eight staff. So we had no choice to incorporate a, a subsidiary account where we started bingo. And as it slowly progressed, we started making uh, money and hiring more staff and offering more programming and um, airing more Indigenous artists um, regionally, specifically in the region. Um, we have a lot of artists coming from all over Saskatchewan, more so on the west side. So that's kind of a bit of history, how we evolved. And then um, in the 90s, we had a strategic plan that we we're going to go into uh, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, Regina, and North Back. North Battleford and uh, Yorkton area and to be inclusive of those southern languages and we we currently do that uh, we have a split feed where um, what you hear in Yorkton is not necessarily what you hear up here so it's there's a split feed and there's some uh, southern languages that are incorporated uh, for their audience for their needs and it's sprinkled through the network as well and we do that with Cree uh, and Dene in the South. So it, it's, um, it's a great organization. And we try to airplay a lot of indigenous artists because they don't have the platform um, in mainstream that will air some of their music. Um, so I guess radio airplay was uncertain to mainstream media but is now steadily have those indigenous artists all over all the indigenous networks across Canada. And I believe there's 13 that were originally funded under the, under the Northern Native Broadcast Access Program. Some are just specifically uh, television, but there's 10 of us that are uh, radio 
uh, networks regional. So one of them is NCI out of Manitoba, CFWE in uh, Alberta, Shona FM in Yoke, uh, Yukon, and um, um, CFNR in BC, um, Wawate in Jans Bay Cree Communications. And other um, provinces like that have their own. And then we have the new one um, in Toronto and Ottawa that was uh, funded, um, not totally funded, but a APTN did invest a lot of money to start those um, indigenous radio networks in Ottawa and Toronto. So that's kind of a background of how we evolved um, through networks. Um, did you want me to proceed with uh, indigenous artists? Yeah, I, I really wanted to um, ask you because um, a lot like you were mentioning, uh, NBC sometimes is the only radio station that will play a lot of these up and coming indigenous artists. And I wonder what your thoughts are behind that and why NBC chooses to play those artists. For artists that uh, come from um, local communities like Beauval, um, Isla Cross, um, Wallace and Fond du Lac, all these local artists have um, dreams to be an artist on a regional or national app platform. And we airplay their music because they were, uh, mainstream wouldn't play them at the time. Um, mainstream still doesn't play them uh, um, a lot. The local artists that, uh, that just want that bit of airtime for artists on our uh, regional or national uh, radio networks. Uh, all, a lot of them have indigenous roots. Um, and we give them that time um, as performers, as artists uh, to showcase their music because a lot of them do have talent. And a lot of them, like the mainstream, they'll play the um, Buffy St. Marie's or the Donnie Perantos. And, but there's still those local artists that need to showcase their talent. We, we, you never know if they're gonna have a, a, a record deal um, or you never know if they're gonna be highlighted at a different higher platform. So you, you, you give everybody the benefit of the doubt and you, you try and help them as much as you can. And, and we certainly are open to doing that. We always have been and we always will be. Awesome. Yeah, NBC has helped, has gave, given tremendous help to a lot of Indigenous artists throughout the years. And I know, I personally know a lot of artists that um, credit NBC with a lot of their early success and, and introducing them to new audiences. What does it mean to you as um, the CEO of NBC when you see these artists that, you know, they, they had their, their first ever radio play, airplay on NBC, and then you get to see them you know, going out on tour and, you know, reaching even more radio success. What does that mean to you personally, Deb? Well, when they get a record deal or recording and performing at a national or higher platform, you know, I credit my staff for, you know, um, listening to me and giving these uh, local artists the, um, the airplay and the platform on NBC to showcase their talent. And it, it's just really satisfying and a gratitude and that you can be successful and you're better than yeah. you're, you can be anybody. Uh, you, you're just as good as anybody else, I guess, on that, on those platforms, uh, whether you're a music performer, um, just, there's no shortage of artists in, in Indian country. There's a lot that I think that should be airplayed and I don't know if it's a, it's a shyness or whatever, but, but it's just very gratifying to, to see artists when they record their own music and they come back to us and we share with NCI or they go to NCI or at AMSA and then we airplay them and it's just like, wow. Or even if I'm Ottawa and I'm listening to their Ottawa radio station or Toronto or Winnipeg, and I'm, you know, pretty proud of them. You know, you're all right you're always dialoguing and meeting with the, the CEOs of the different radio networks and where, you know, music always comes up or this song or this person where they're from and you kind of give a land, the landscape where they're from and, you know, the, um, the remote or their population and, and they come a long way. 
the artist that comes to mind when I think about NBC success stories, um, the number one artist that I can think about is, is Marty Ballantyne, yeah. who not only had airplay on NBC radio, but he was working with you guys for a time. And then he had this like massive television success and radio. He got a record deal. Um, do you remember Marty's first uh, kind of working days in NBC? Well, Marty was probably, he was in this, I'm going to show this to you. He was in this magazine realm and he was um, nominated for the uh, top 30 under 30 um, broadcasters and general managers across Canada. You know, and that's a lot to be proud of from a young guy coming from Sandy Bay, coming to La Ronge to work, to work with us. And uh, he's, he started like everybody else, um, doing a radio show. He was our bingo. He was stamping cards, delivering to our outlets to make our money because that's how we make our money and, you know, paid for his salary. Um, and then uh, starting the sales and marketing office and then working in sales too and then working his way up to the general manager. And then I was working under him. And he was my boss in the 90s for about five years. Then he got a great record deal with EMI uh, with breach of trust. And um, he left the corporation to pursue his uh, national um, music platform. And he continues to showcase his, his talent ac across Canada. It's and it's hard to keep up with him because he's from yeah. one province, one town to next day he's way in Ontario. The next day he's in Sandy Bay. It's just like, yeah. But it, um, it's so easy to see that the, the heart and the family aspect to NBC Radio because a lot of these people that were involved early on, they, they still come back and they still visit and they still, you know, have all these fond memories. And you actually put a book together. Um, yeah. With all this, with all these memories and history of NBC, um, where can yeah. you find that? Well, you can find it at my Prince Albert office, which is twenty seven eleven Street West. You, uh, they're here in Larange, but um, we'll probably start um, selling them. I uh, initially, what got me into it is I was. Uh, FSIN had posted a request for a proposal to for a producer to do the history and evolution of FSIN. So I applied for it and I thought if I can do documentaries, I can do a book. So lo and behold, I got the contract and uh, we launched the book in 2000, I don't know, 10. And I got to thinking a couple years later. I'm going to do a book for NBC. Uh, that's probably going to be my masterpiece and whoever the next CEO can carry on. Um, but a lot of growth and development went into that. It took me really probably two years to research and produce. A lot of that information was actually here in the garage. It just taking the time in evenings and weekends to complete it. And it, it took me a year and a half to complete. So <clears throat> it's, um, very interesting from the local, regional, national uh, perspective and how we became a founding member of the Aboriginal People's Television Network and, and produced documentaries for the network and, and uh, just a lot of staff that come through this office that we were able to employ and help along the way. And, you know, uh, um, me starting out with NBC and really have to apply myself to to be the CEO and to do producing documentaries and now history and pictorial books. There's I I don't want to take too much of your time, Deb, but you you bring that up and I and I have to I have to let the our viewers here know um, your success story. I mean, you started at NBC quite early, and like you said, you you had to work your way up up the ladder. And, yeah. um, and being an Indigenous woman, you know, oftentimes it's not just, it's not 
easy. It, it's not just like you all of a one second you're here and then the next second you're the CEO of NBC. I know how hard you worked. And, you know, I, I, I wonder if you have any words of advice for any other um, young Indigenous women that, you know, would like to see them themselves in your shoes or, um, you know, the like to see themselves as a CEO of some place. Well, the thing for me is I started here May 31st, 1989. I just had a daughter May 1st, 1989. So my daughter was only 30 years old and I had a phone interview and I got another interview saying uh, I was um, one of the, uh, I was uh, one of the successful ad applicants and I had to do another interview. Then I got a call, I got the position so I moved to LaRange and lived with my grandparents who were alive at the time and uh, really learned a lot. But it was so fascinating when we went to our first workshop and they were talking about documentaries they were going to produce because uh, prior to APTN, it was called mm -hmm. Television in Canada and then we were going to eventually um, produce documentaries for the, for the network at the time. And then there was, uh, of course, uh, political issues. And uh, so <clears throat> TVNC eventually uh, formally known, or how do I put it? There was a, we we're gonna go national. We had to change the name. So we went to APTN. They chose the name, the Aboriginal People's Net Television Network. And we launched September 1st, 1999. But during that time, you had to learn how to produce documentaries, how to edit, uh, how to get license fees, how to do the funding applications. And of course, I had to get some training in Regina too to do those um, television applications because they're really complex. And the thing with television too, you have to have upfront money all the time. Then you, you get your tax credit a year later. So you're constantly going to the bank to prove yourself that you were capable, more than capable of paying it back, but it just took some year um, cash flow. So there, it, it's a, it was definitely a learning curve and I really, really had to apply myself and you, you have to uh, take a lot of time in the evenings and weekends to read thoroughly through those, through those um, funding applications. And, uh, you know, there's con consultants or um, a legal team that do help you. They're called entertainment lawyers that do the television. And it, it, uh, they get quite costly, but it was uh, certainly worth everything, all my effort to, to be the CEO. And I still struggle. I still have hard times and I still have challenges, but it's day by day. And I, you know, just thank the creator that I, I'm blessed with the a good position and good people that uh, support me. And uh, a lot of the growth and development is done. All those early, early years of vision, how we're going to go to Prince Albert, you know, it was such a dream because I started to hear when there was only 10 local radio stations, like we're in 70 communities now and 40 local radio station that, you know, that come a long way. And then just being in PA was, so exciting for us. And then just go branching off into Saskatoon, Regina, North Battleford, Yorkton. And, you know, that was another vision. That was a costly vision. They're all costly and they're all self operating through sales and um, bingo efforts. And then I got a few grants with uh, Northern Lights Casino for like the Weaco Insight, you know, because it was from the North. So I was able to get a few grants here and there as we went further south. It's but about most of the work. Yes. Yeah, and you guys put in a lot of work, you specifically, Deb, I'm um, constantly um, inspired by what you do and the work you've done. And on top of that all, you are the perfect representation um, for NBC Radio because you are a, a band member of the Lac La Indian Band. Yes. You speak your language. I know that's very important to you, and that comes across in NBC operations as well. You, you combine all that and um, seeing how far NBC has has come um, since its inception. Uh, um, where would you like to see it go in the next ten years, say? Well, I would like to be totally um, self sufficient and not rely on government funding, but we'll always need that. Um, 
by that time, um, my Laurent office was paid for, uh, still working towards paying off my mortgage with uh, the PA office. Um, I'd have, I would like, you know what I always envisioned was broadcast news. We purchase it, the national news is on every hour up, up, up until 6 p.m. I would like to have an indigenous, national, local, national, international news, just on indigenous news. And it's that service is provided to all the radio stations across Canada. And that would be researched and all produced, all indigenous um, personnel, staff. That's what I'd like to see. I, I, I can see all that happening. And once again, great ideas. And I know um, I yeah. know that's going to happen. Thank you so much, Deb, for taking the time to uh, let me interview you today. Is there anything you would like to add? Um, I'd just like to thank the um, listeners for advertising with us, uh, the bingo players, for supporting our bingo efforts. Because if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for years, we'd be just talking for nothing, playing for nothing. and you know, a lot of this is um, when you're in a remote community and that's all you have. And if NBC ever closed, which I know it won't, it'd be pretty lonely Northern Saskatchewan for the, uh, the listenership out there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, you are most welcome. <laughs>